everyone. Welcome to season two of the Voice of Adoptees podcast. This segment is called Chats with Kat, and I'm your host, Kat. I'm currently here with returning Russian adoptee Svet, who is a pro- photojournalist working out of Ukraine. She channels how she feels through the power of photography in order to tell a story. So, Svet, welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much. Of course. So tell me a bit about where you are now. Tell me about, about your trip and how it's going. Where are you currently in Ukraine? Yeah, so last time I did the podcast, I was actually in my hometown of Baltimore, and now I'm back in Ukraine where I'm based, and I'm in Odessa, which is all the way in the south on the port of the Black Sea, and I am actually working with an orphanage, so I thought it would be really interesting to talk about how that's been for me and sort of shed light on personally my, I don't know, like emotional state. Oh, yeah, definitely. Was that your always your main goal in being there in Ukraine when you wanted to go and visit? Yeah, so I've been here since last year covering various aspects of this full-scale invasion and war now. And sort of what drove me here was initially the idea of displaced families and youth. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm a returning journalist, I've really tried to dive into the subject more deeply. And this is the first orphanage that's really let me inside. And it's really interesting. Okay. So you're saying that this is the first orphanage that has let you inside. Tell me a bit about that experience. Is it surreal being an adoptee, probably having been in an orphanage? Like, take me through the process. Take me through what it was like when you first arrived and what you saw. What was the first thing you saw when you arrived to the orphanage? And how did that initially make you feel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I... First of all, it's incredibly hard to cover orphanages as a journalist. Access is incredibly limited in terms of sort of respecting the identity of children. And I completely understand that. So when I arrived at this orphanage, they were very open to me specifically because my upbringing. I was raised Jewish. This is a Jewish orphanage. And it is a relatively safer part of Ukraine. Recently, they've had a lot more bombings because it's on the port and the grain deal was incinerated by Russia last week. So, you know, I I was also surprised they were so welcoming to me. But my first impression was, wow, like this is a really nice orphanage. From what I know, from where I came from in kind of like central northern Russia, the orphanage was incredibly kind of downrun and they were doing the best they could. So they have a lot more resources here, but the stories are incredibly heartbreaking and they really sort of told me about each individual child on my first day. And that was really hard for me. I think that as an adoptee, you're intrinsically connected to the concept of being in an orphanage, but I think I don't know. I I feel for these kids and it's been really special for me to be able to kind of spend time with them. Right. So what is their experience as orphans, quote unquote? Are they orphans? Are they a result of what's been going on in Ukraine? Can you share without giving details? Because I want to respect their privacy and the privacy of the orphanage and everything. Can you just give us an overview about the children? Sure. Yeah. And I cleared this with the orphanage before I signed up for doing this time slot. So I really respect you saying that. But their experience as adoptees, I think this orphanage functions as a open space for children, regardless of the war. So mm-hmm. the the war really stands as the backdrop for their experience in the way that a lot of their situations aren't necessarily related to the fact that Ukraine is at war, but the safety that they feel in their own displaced home is challenged by the fact that they're in a war zone. And, you know, initially when I showed up, there was sort of, there's such a wide range. So there used to be over 100 orphans at this orphanage. And when the war began, they sent almost 60% of their children to other places for safety. They kept the children whose biological families are present in Ukraine and who have a relationship with those families, but they are fully orphans and have spent 
some of them have spent 15 years in this orphanage. So this is not a temporary place for them. This is very much a permanent home. And the story that I'm focusing on now is about a two-week-old baby who was just removed from the front lines and is, you know, sort of transitioning into this home. And as someone who was an infant in an orphanage, watching this process has been really interesting for me personally. So based off of, we're going to piggyback off of that, based off of your adoption story, your experience, your feelings, everything that you have been through, what do you feel about this, this child that is now two weeks old? And you see this child maybe going through the same thing that you had to go through. What are your thoughts about it? How does it reflect on you and your experience? What are your worries maybe for them? And what are your hopes for them as well? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, first of all, this is, even though it's a Ukrainian orphanage, they do speak Russian because it's all the way in the southeast of Ukraine. So not only am I seeing this sort of mirror of my own experience as being a young child, but also linguistically and sort of even like architecturally, it's very Russian. So I think that I feel really connected to the story. And in terms of the well-being of the child, I mean, it's actually like a really beautiful story. This baby really like had no hope. And now they're in this place where they're just incredibly cared for. And in a way, I think it's not fully representative of my own experience where I was in a place where there were a ton of babies and not a lot of one-on-one care. There's probably like five adults to this one baby and everything they need is taken care of. There's so much love and it's really uplifting when you think about the fact that they're in a war zone. Oh, absolutely. So does it give you hope for the the child's future? Because it's kind of like you said, in not just perhaps your story, but also I feel in many Russian orphanages, there's usually one per one adult per multiple babies, children, and things like that. So does it give you a sort of positive mood buff knowing that this child is so cared for? And does it give you like a newfound sense of hope for this child that is eventually going to either find a family or just, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that I'm definitely very excited that she's, you know, so loved. But I also see that these children have been here for many years, that there's not a huge cycle of rehoming them. So it's more likely that she will grow up until almost adulthood, probably in this orphanage. And you know, the only hope is that she continues to be so well cared for. But, you know, I am also like learning as as I go every day, I think I'm realizing more and more about the complexity of what it means to care for an infant in the situation. And I definitely hope for the best. But it's it's very hard to predict what will what will come for them and what will come for Odessa as a region in Ukraine. Right. I, I understand that. And were you So were you able to take photos inside of the orphanage or is that something? Yeah, we did like bath time tonight. Like we were, you know, yeah, I, I, the, the girl's name is Sarah and, you know, I, in a way I was almost worried. I thought I would feel like maternal toward this child instantly. I'm very all in, in the way that I work, but there has been like a really cool balance of me knowing that I'm there to photograph a story and then also kind of have these quiet moments with her that I just get to like sit and see her be a baby. And all of the children who are there are much older, you know, ages probably three to 15, and they're all caring for her. So it's been this really cool experience of watching her have this family that I don't even know if she could really realize how special it is. Yeah, touching on that. I was actually going to ask about the older children and if you saw them helping out and feeling protective over the other children, perhaps in a very, obviously in a positive way. I I assume, so I assume you're seeing a lot of that, which is really beautiful to hear. It's really transparent and it's really, actually in a way, it's probably the hardest thing for me to deal with. When When I see it, I think maybe for the first time 
since I was young, I, I'm really like contemplating what my own experience was like, because it just seems so rare that there's this much care and devotion. And I'm almost positive that that was not something that I got to experience. So for me, it's like beautiful, but it's also like, wow, like how, how lucky and how special this is. Yeah. So it's kind of like a bittersweet thing. So do you feel that there's any kind of feelings of not resentment, but do you feel that there are any sort of negative feelings that you're starting to kind of battle with? Did you feel any of those negative feelings when you first went to Ukraine? or anything like that. It's obviously a very complex sort of situation being an adoptee, coming from your experience and coming here to see a more loving environment. Talk, Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who's coming in and seeing the full spectrum of this war, I, I don't think that I really ever felt like it was a competitive situation. I think that I, I really understand how crucial caring for Ukrainian youth is right now. And I'm really grateful that I'm able to tell this story. And I think that I'm a very good person to tell this story. So I I entered Ukraine with that um, mentality. And I've continued my work, knowing that, you know, maybe I can tell the stories of these children a bit more personally than someone who hasn't had my past. Mm, I can see that. (laughs) When you take photos and you tell a story through your photos, what is the voice that you hope your photos convey? I I guess like the inherent sort of joy that children have, the forgiveness that they have. I I think, especially the older children, like they're very aware of what's going on when there's an air raid, like everyone goes to the bunker. I mean, there's just no way to sugarcoat the reality of being here, but in a way, it's the safest place for them, which I think is really interesting. And I hope that my photos show that it's a calm, it is complicated, it's incredibly complex, and there can be really loving and joyous moments and really horrible circumstances. And at the end of the day, like, I think anyone can relate to a child's experience. It's really not about the politics of war. It's about the fact that these children deserve to be loved. And hopefully, they feel that in their own situation. So do you feel that they, do you feel that these children have grown up very quickly in this sort of situation? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a huge part of the way that I approach the work is kind of hoping to preserve that childhood that maybe they don't even realize they're losing. But you, I mean, you lose so much when you have to take into account that your safety is at risk and you're caring for other, I would say siblings. I mean, they very much act like siblings. Right now, there's about 30 children at this orphanage. And it's very hard to tell who's related to who because they care for each other like family. So I think in that way, um, yeah, I mean, they don't get to just be children and just grow up having a great time all the time. But this particular organization is very proactive and making sure that they have as many good experiences as possible. So tell me a little bit more about the organization. What what is it? What do they specifically do? Yeah, so I was raised Jewish and this is Chabad in Odessa, which is one of the most religious kind of observances of the Jewish religion and they raise their children with a very strong sense of religion and although that is like very present in their practices it's also kind of separate from the fact that they just raise children to be happy and well educated and you know communal and i actually spoke to my mom yesterday and when i did the first interview i didn't tell her i was doing the interview cuz i was a little nervous about talking about my adoption and what she would think and we've come a long way and So I called her and I was like, I think I'm going to talk about this. And she asked, you know, like, does religion matter when they accept adoptees? And I asked them this and they said that they would never turn away a child. But they, the follow up was really interesting. They said, did you know you were adopted? And I was like, yeah, I was told really young, really from the get go. My parents told me I was adopted. And they said, I think that's incredibly important. And for that reason, when we adopt 
or bring in children who are not inherently Jewish, we try to outsource them to other orphanages so that they are raised in an environment that is not put on them, but actually like help them figure out who they are. And I thought that was really interesting that they consider that, that they recognize that their beliefs aren't necessarily there to be part of every child's upbringing, but really the children who are already born into this like community. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And it's, it's like you said, it's really beautiful and supportive, where it's more like, there's no need to quote unquote, force upon, right? It's, it's a better way of supporting the children. And like you said, allowing them to eventually become who they want to be, which is very, it's beautiful, especially in a time like this. So out of the photos that you have taken in the orphanage, which is the most meaningful to you and which do you feel would be the most meaningful to others? Are they the same? Is it different? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a a great question. I mean, I, I was going through them right before we got on this call and I think that there are a lot of photos that show how other children are caring for this child. Like it feels like a village, you know, like how how cool is it that this baby is just so beloved? And I think that, you know, the apex of this situation is her primary caretaker. And to me, this resonates the most because I know that we all had someone, some probably woman who took care of us for the first years of our lives, who cared for us like her own child. And I have a real like a lot of really touching moments of this. And I think one of those would probably be the standout image. But, you know, it's just it's really interesting because I don't know who this person is in my life, but to watch sort of the same version of her care for another infant is it's been really interesting. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, there's something really sweet about a photo that has that sort of maternity figure taking care of not only children, but it's almost like you can sense their their love and kindness and devotion through the photo. So when a person kind of looks at it, what I usually gather from those photos is just a lot of support, kindness, calm, you know, and you see someone who is is really not only stepping up to the plate, but is also doing the best that they can in the situation in which they're given. And during right now, I feel it's a very inspiring thing to see. Yeah. And it's a 24 hour job. You know, I I, I feel like taking on an infant is not an easy task. And the only way to care for them is to care for them like they are your own. And I hope that every child at this age who's in the same situation has that kind of love. But I, I also know that's not the case. So as I continue working with children and adopted children, I'm interested to see sort of the parallels in other places. Oh, yeah. And so the photos that you take and the experiences that you have and are sharing with us, with the world, how do they reflect what you are currently feeling from this last trip? Um, I think it's like actually very hard to (laughs) fully express how I'm feeling, which is one of the reasons I wanted to try to talk to you. I, I think that any great photojournalist can take great photos. I do feel like you know, when I'm there, I, I, I see this deeper layer of why I'm there and taking these particular pictures. And I, I hope that they resonate with people. I hope they understand the full spectrum of the situation. But at the same time, like the news is very hard right now. And simply photographing an orphanage is not exactly newsworthy. It, it's very interesting to me because I think these stories matter so much and I, I will continue telling them regardless if I have support. But um, in like the news world, uh, I, I understand that I'm really doing this for my own kind of journey to make sure that people hear that these stories are happening and that they matter. Yeah, absolutely. And so throughout this whole process, how is your mental health? What are what are you thinking? What are you feeling aside from going to the orphanage and taking these photos and interacting? How does it feel to just be there in general? How are you doing? Oh, I appreciate that. I actually think I thrive in these situations. You know, I always felt like I was really born to do this work. And my history is 
so pivotal in, in the way that I approach how I work, in the way that I respect the subjects that I work with. I mean, I really don't have to think twice about how I'm shooting and whether, you know, the environment is accepting because I, I really understand how some of these kids are feeling. And, you know, I respect that off the bat. And I, I don't know, I, I, I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do because of where I came from. And it's not really about me. And in a way, like my inquisitiveness and my own story throughout my life has been answered by me doing this work, even if it's in a slightly different region. I feel so at peace by telling these stories. And I just like never thought that would happen. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm honestly very happy for you because I feel for adoptees, getting to that point where you're at is can be a journey. It can be difficult. And if you look back at your journey to where you are now, did you ever think you would get to this point? Did you ever feel you would be this strong and resilient and be here specifically from where you started? No, I had a really, really rocky situation coming through this. And, you know, a lot of that was not sure that I could do this work that I always really wanted to do. But I also feel like as someone who's adopted and, you know, other adoptees who probably have passions in other places, I think it's really important for us to pursue them because they are a reflection of our stories. And even if it's not working with other adopted children specifically, like you are representing a community of somebody who has gone through something that is very specific and very unique. And this is my way of sharing that experience. And how did you come to this realization? How did you come to this point? What made you say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. Hmm. I guess like I always thought I would do it. I just never really had the belief that I could do it. And then once you kind of start breaking down the barriers of insecurity, it, it becomes much easier to follow this passion. And I think for me, once I really started seeing displaced children, you know, there was no turning back. I was very, very sure that I was going to continue telling stories about what they were going through. And I hope that it helps people understand the experience of adoption as a, as a whole. I agree. And you were just mentioning about these barriers of insecurities, the barriers of insecurities that you have felt and been through in your life. Do you see them in the children in the orphanage where you're at? And what are these different barriers, if we could have a refresher for, for the audience? Yeah, you know, these kids are still young. Uh, I, I think I said the oldest was 15. I think about when I was 15. And I'm like, yeah, did I really know what I wanted to do in life? Probably not. But I do think that in terms of really finding a place in the world, this varies based on your adoptive experience and whatever came before that. And for me, I was put into such a loving and caring family, but I always really needed a sense of purpose. And I always really kept searching for how I could give back and do humanitarian work in a way that really like worked in my lifestyle. And um you know, it just wasn't a linear path. And I think that over time, you know, me wanting to just do what other people wanted, and then me wanting to do what I really wanted has meshed into a very clear purpose. But it took time. And um, I think that's something that a lot of people reconcile with, regardless of if they're adopted or not, like, who are we? What's our identity? What are we really doing? And I was lucky enough to find this passion for photography early in life. And it's been really cool to go through the highs and the lows of making sure that I could get to a place where I can do work that aligns with that. What was the other part of the question? Sorry. You know, I forget. <laughs> oh my gosh, I feel so much better about no, this. Yeah. It's yeah. okay. It's okay. I honestly, I just, I throw things out there. I throw random things out there. And if it sticks, it sticks. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, I, I love, I love the hardship that I've like gone through to figure out who I am. I think that it has made me incredibly empathetic to a wide range of experiences. I think that it has really like secured me in the 
understanding of why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, you know, when things are easy, you don't always appreciate them. And I'm really grateful every day that I get to do this work. Definitely. So working with the children, what is one way that you feel that you've inspired or helped or supported any of the orphans in the orphanage? You know, I think it it presents itself in small moments, you know, like when a kid grabs your hand and drags you somewhere or like I, I, I noticed in this situation that some of the kids had a much harder time trusting an outsider. And I really resonate with that. I've always had a really hard time with trust. And I really I, I saw that and I was like, listen, I know what's going on here. And it's really important that you give them that space and you show up in the environment in the way that they're comfortable and just give it time. And my approach is based off of how I feel they are feeling. And eventually, you know, you get to really bond with them. And I don't always know if every photo I take can help them. But what I can do is be there. And, you know, when they take my hand, I'm going to hold it. And I just I think that there are small things that allow us to connect that can have a resounding impact. I completely agree. And I was about to ask like, if you felt like you related to anyone that you've met over there. And it was it's relieving to hear that you did, because it's it's like you said, many of us understand that that exact struggle. And it, I think it was really beautiful that you you were able to give them space and make them feel comfortable, you know. And I think what is one moment that you are never going to forget from your time here? Um, I actually think it's still to come. You know, I'm like in the throes of this story. I, I always have a really hard time saying goodbye to places that I connect with. I don't think this will be any different. I will probably cry. I think that makes me more human. I, I love that I get so emotionally invested in the stories that I tell. So I'm going to predict that, you know, when it is time to say goodbye to this particular orphanage, it's going to be hard for me and it's going to sit with me for a very long time. But I also always try to, you know, take those experiences or take the little gifts and leave little gifts and things that just, you know, make it so it's not so fleeting and really important to both sides. So what is one thing that you can tell these children that you needed to hear? What is something that your younger self needed to hear when you were their age? Yeah, that's like so deep. <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess. I, I think that even when you're completely loved, sometimes it's really hard to feel love. There's like a, a distinction between really being understood and really feeling love. And when I was young, I, I really felt the love around me, but I don't know if I always felt that everyone understood the dichotomy of that as a, as a child and as an adoptee. And I hope that they understand that there are people like me and other people who are more adult and have been through what they've been through. And there, there is solace as you get older and just to, you know, don't feel like that that's uncomfortable feeling. It, it's very common, I think. Oh, I love that. And how, how we as listeners, how can we connect to currently what is going on in Ukraine? How can we get involved? Is there a website that we can visit to support the orphanage? How can we get involved? Sure. I mean, you know, I guess I could send you a link for this particular orphanage that I'm working for. But I, I think the biggest thing to recognize is that when you read the news and you don't really want to hear another story about the war in Ukraine, which I think is very common globally, Recognize that every time an air raid goes off, whether there's a rocket or not, there are thousands of kids running to bunkers who are just disrupted in their day to day childhood. And then they go underground and they have to stay there until they know it's safe. And that experience is traumatic. And I hope that people recognize that this is not just a violence war. This is an incredibly humanitarian war. And there are children affected every day in every part of Ukraine. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. How can the, well, 
I'm not really sure how to ask this. I'm coming up with it over just off the top of my head where I want to, how can we advocate for the children of Ukraine? Save the Children is an organization that's doing really good work. There's a lot of various organizations doing various initiatives. We're walking into a new school year, September. And, you know, maybe I can send you an update in terms of like what supplies could be sent, things like this. You know, it's summer here. So there's just not like a clear line of funding that I can give to you right now. But I I am actively, you know, looking. And the issue is that it's very hard to just get things here. So a lot of people I speak to want to send teddy bears or crayons or books. And it's really getting those supplies into the areas that need it the most. And then, you know, the funding can't always be trusted. Like a lot of great organizations have good intentions, but is it really going to where it needs to go? I I don't have like full faith, but I will definitely like try to find some very hardcore trusting places that people can fund the childhood experience in Ukraine. Unfortunately, it's just a lot of money is going toward the actual war. And that's internally also. Right. So I know going back to your photography, do you have a place that you post it? Where can we find your work? Yeah. So I have a website. It is my name, www.sethjacqueline.com. So weird to self-promote. I have an Instagram. I just got a TikTok, which is so weird because I'm older and I'm just trying to figure out different avenues that I can sort of portray what's really happening here. And I will send you all those links and, you know, people can just support the work that I'm doing. And then, you know, I also follow organizations that do the same kind of humanitarian work for children. And if anyone has questions, they can email me, they can message me, you know, I'm, I'm happy to redirect or do what I can to, you know, actively help children. Oh, absolutely. And so what is something in this podcast episode that you wanted to talk about that has not been touched on? I want to talk about that hasn't been touched on. You know, I I guess for, hmm, I don't know, I, I guess I would like to touch on, we've gone over so many things. Yeah, I mean, I I think that as an adult, there are a lot of parts of my adoption that I've addressed and also packed away and there are days where I feel really solidified in my experience and there are other days that I'm like whoa this is really taking me off my feet in terms of how I'm how I'm feeling and I guess you know maybe we can talk about that adoption is not something that you just pack away ever it is throughout your life you are always going to feel various things about being adopted and you know it's really okay to not always feel okay about it and also really be appreciative in your own experience and really okay with your own experience I don't know I mean this is feels very abstract but no that's good that's good you know with the work that I'm doing it really is day to day there there are moments where I'm like wow this is just really hard for me to deal with as an adoptee. And then there are moments that I'm like, wow, I just feel like a journalist like any other day. And I think that's surprising for me. So going back to this, if you if we were to look inside your mind right now, what does the space in that look like? You know, I'm really thinking about Sarah. I, I like I'm I'm really focused on her story. I'm really focused on the community around her. I the second that I met her, I was like, I knew I really wanted to talk about how special her story was and if you look into my mind you'll like probably just see pictures of her because you know I I don't know if I have endless time with her but I really hope that the work that I'm doing can you know add to the care that she already has in a way that when she's older maybe she'll see the photographs and I never had photographs of people caring for me so you know maybe that will help her in her long-term experience. So something I like to keep in mind as an adoptee, I basically pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. And a way that I did it is I took a look inside my mind and I've decided that it's a few things. 
the outside looks a certain way, and then the inside is more like a hallway where there's all these different doors. Some are open, some are closed, some are like roped off with teeth. And when I when you're describing that to me, the way that I kind of picture your mind being is like a photo room. You have one wall that is all of these photos of all of your experiences, some of them that are probably in folders but are hanging on this wall. And then it's kind of like you have your your dark room where you're creating these memories through your eyes and obviously your camera and you're developing them and putting them on the wall. And I don't know if it's messy. I don't know if it's neat. And the reason why I ask this is because the inside of our mind and the way we see the space inside our mind is a reflection of how we put energy out into the world, you know, and our intentions and and how we internalize things. And I think when we look at it through this sort of perspective, we can understand ourselves better because you were talking about how naturally with like other adoptees growing up, it's kind of like difficult for a lack of a better term. And through all of the different difficulties that you've experienced, do you feel like the space inside your mind from a child to a teen to now an adult, do you feel like it's changed? Absolutely. Yeah. It's like completely more organized than it was. I like this analogy that you bring up. Yeah. I mean, as a human being, we go through so many shifts as we age. As an adoptee, it's really hard when you don't have a center core of reference, especially if there's question marks in your past, right? Like, it's very hard to find a center where you're like, wow, this is really where this is coming from, or this is sort of why I'm feeling this way. And I think as I've gotten older, especially like when you talk about why I do this work, this has completely stabilized me in every part of my sort of life and existence. Like, I really think that it is not just a product of my story, but the purpose of my story. And it's allowed a lot of calmness internally. I also think that there's like incredible power to being adopted. Like, I really stand by like the fact that we're like superhuman by going through these experiences and coming out as functioning people, or even if you're struggling still, like you have been through so much. And I respect every adopted person I've met with like such a hardcore understanding of how cool it is that we've been through this and that you know, we're still here and we're still talking about it. I like to think that adoptees gain a sort of resilience from the experiences of being adopted and then going through life, knowing that one, they're adopted two, maybe they don't fit in. They have, you know, they're questioning themselves and they're, maybe they want to be a people pleaser. Maybe they don't trust other people. Maybe they're, they don't know where they belong on a general scale like on a macro level scale, on a micro level scale, they don't know where they belong with themselves. And I'm hearing a lot of these sorts of things, which is trauma. And the way I look at it is, you know, every person, when we look at ourselves, we look in a mirror. So when we do reflections, we look in ourselves in the internal mirror. And when we go through trauma, that sort of shatters. Usually what we do is we try to go through life, putting the mirror back together. And we usually get tape we put the pieces, we try to tape it up there. And it's not until we begin the process of healing that we realize we ourselves have super glue. And that's when we can really glue the pieces back together. And even though when we look back in that mirror, it's all fragmented, it's all there. And we come to this, yeah, we come to this understanding that, you know, people bend, they don't break. People are fragmented, but they are still standing just like this fragmented mirror and they are still strong. And so through this sort of analogy, how, how can you say you have grown as a person in total through your life, through what you do now sort of deal? Yeah, yeah. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more, of course. I also think that I kind of love that what I do is an upfront kind of approach to trauma. You know, I literally stand in the thick of trauma and I say like, what can I do to tell these stories instead of shying away from the pain of it all? And I think that's a huge measure of growth. You know, you're not really told to address 
your own experiences when you're young. You're not really told to fight for tough situations. You're taught to ignore them. I mean, society teaches you to, you know, push forward with a strong face. And I, I think that I did that for a really long time. And now I'm standing in the epicenter of horrible, horrible trauma. And my own sort of battle with it has like allowed me to be stronger for it. You know, I have this armor that makes me very confident that I should be here and I should be doing this for the benefit of other people's trauma. Like we can all work together kind of. Yeah. You know, the, a, a really difficult battle is the battle against yourself. And when you understand that a lot of the time you are battling yourself, you, we often do this thing where we say, I have been through that. I don't want another person to go through that. So I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that they don't. Yeah. And I, I think, I think trauma is like so subjective, but once you experience one kind of trauma, you really can understand a spectrum of trauma. Right. And so, you know, even when I'm working with soldiers who have just been through incredible physical and emotional trauma, like I understand a different kind of trauma, but I also understand trauma and it allows us to connect. I think that people really all experience trauma on different levels. And if we really use that as a baseline to have a conversation or to tell a story or to take photographs or whatever you do, you know, like it, it's a safe place for anyone because it, it exists in all of us in different extremes. So through the trauma that you have been through, how do you feel, how has it empowered you? How does it, in, how does it motivate you to empower others? I guess like I encourage people to recognize that our experiences aren't comparative. A lot of times because I work in a war zone, I go home and I'll talk to friends and they'll be like, oh, well, you don't care about this. And I'm like, no, I, I do care about this. Like your experience is just as valuable as my experience. And my experience is just as valuable as the person who had an even more traumatic experience. So I, I think that it's important that we hold our own trauma like respectfully and share it and, you know, not really put it against everything else that's happening around us, but use it to talk about the diversity of trauma itself. I, I couldn't agree more. And I just wanted to say thank you for joining me on the first episode of Chats with Cat. Super exciting. Thank you so much. I hope I hope I did do well and you know that this is interesting to people. And yeah, again, if anyone has questions, they're welcome to reach out to me. Oh, definitely. I definitely encourage it. She has a very interesting story and I can't wait to see some of your pictures. I'm really excited about it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'll definitely send them to you. And it's so nice to meet you. And it, you know, it's really cool as somebody who has adopted that you're, you know, helping this platform. I hope other people feel comfortable talking about their, you know, situation. I hope so too. So everyone stay tuned for another episode of Chats with Cat every other Wednesday on the Voice of Adoptees podcast. And always remember, someone somewhere is thinking of you. You are not alone.